All right, welcome to another special edition of the MIT VCP Club Virtual Speaker Series. Very excited to have Sean McGuire here with us. Uh, Sean, uh, he spent a lot of time studying uh, mathematics and science at USC, Stanford, Caltech, where he got his PhD, uh, founded a company, Expanse, uh, that was acquired by Palo Alto Network, spent time at GV, Google Ventures, and now is a partner at Sequoia Capital. Uh, excited to learn more about his background, advice that he has for us, uh, for students that want to get into investing, students that want to get into entrepreneurship, into, into broader technology, or just, you know, studying science, um, as well as just learning, you know, just a bit about what he sees as the future, uh, and where we all should be spending our time, you know, while at MIT. So going to hand it over to Sean. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, hey everyone. Really great to meet you all. Um, you know, the other beavers, the better known beavers, I, some of you probably don't even know that Caltech are also the beavers, you know, MIT, it's, it's like the Stanford Berkeley relationship or anything, you know, MIT, MIT gets the, the better end of that one a lot. Um, look, it's absolutely wonderful to be here with you all. Um, I think I'll start just with some of my background and how I got where I am and then I think the best part of these is oftentimes Q and A. And so we'll just take a bunch of questions. So I'm originally from Southern California. I grew up in Irvine, California. I was very lucky. One of my cousins was studying computer science at UCLA. He was about 12 years older than I am. I'm actually having dinner with him tonight. I'm still very close with him. And he kind of is a total fluke. One, he was driving to our house for Thanksgiving um, straight from school. And as he was leaving UCLA, they were giving away a bunch of computer parts. This is in 1992. Um, and he basically picked up a bunch of free computer equipment, put it in his car, drove to our house, and he helped me build a computer that kind of night after dinner. And that just absolutely changed my life. So, for, so basically, I built my first computer when I was seven. And since then, I've just been on computers a lot. Um, there were good things and bad things about that. The, the good thing is I you know, acquired some useful skills. The bad thing is that I played a lot of video games and you know, had a 1.8 GPA my first two years of high school, which wasn't, wasn't that great. Um, and so kind of at some point a light, and, and there's more to it than just that, but basically I was bored out of my mind. I, you know, got bullied a little bit, you know, long, long story. And I just kind of didn't see the value in school. And so I just did my own thing and taught myself stuff. Um, and then kind of a switch went off kind of at the beginning of my junior year. I decided I had to leave school, go try to find that I was never going to get into a good college if I kept going down that path. And so I found this thing called the California High School Proficiency Exam, basically a GED equivalency exam. Took it, left high school a couple of years early, went to community college, you know, when I was 17 and 18, transferred to USC. Um, it's kind of a long story, but I'm from Southern California, I had a lot of good friends going there. And kind of when I got there, I was identified as being very talented at math. Um, even, even by MIT standards, you know, I, I know a bunch of people that are professors at MIT now and all of that. Um, and so kind of, they told me to go do a math PhD. So I moved up to Stanford, started grad school after two years. It was an incredible training. Um, I started grad school in 2007 in the stats department at Stanford. I was really interested in theoretical probability. And this is like, before deep learning existed, you know, it was, it was the era of statistical learning, but a lot of the top people from kind of deep learning now were in that department and community. And so it was an incredible kind of training for me. And I got to see all the fundamentals of what is kind of cutting edge machine learning today. They're at a point when it was candidly much easier to understand and digest. And so that was just incredibly valuable. I guess something from the computer days that I didn't say explicitly, but I was a hacker. Um, you know, I, I never did anything too nefarious, but I did like to push the limits as a kid and, and see what I could do. And again, like that was 
not only great training from an actual skills perspective that comes back in the story later on, but was also there's a hacker mentality. The hacker mentality is to just be very clear with what your goal is. And once you have a goal, then to just not quit until you've accomplished your goal, to always try to find, there's always a back door, a side door, a trap door, a, you know, trailing someone else as they go in the front door. Like there's always a way in. And I just, that was ingrained into me from a young age. And it's really hard to explain how important that mentality is, like, or at least has been in my life. And I think is, is in the entrepreneur life and even as a VC. And so anyways, started grad school, decided that I preferred physics. I got really interested in this field called quantum computation, quantum information, which is better known now, but in 2008, wasn't very well known. Um, so I moved on to Caltech, started my PhD in the physics department. The guy named John Presco, who is one of my true mentors, one of the first people in my life that really understood me. I Something that I'm incredibly lucky is I, I think I've had four great mentors in my life. Um, and I really just deeply believe in the importance of mentorship. And I, I've tried to pay that forward to people in my life. And I have a couple of pretty good stories from that. Um, but it, like the four mentors for me, one, my cousin, who I mentioned, who I luckily am having dinner with tonight, um, my PhD advisor. I also had a community college professor who on the side worked for NASA and was really um, just an incredible teacher and amateur astronomer. And he kind of helped me. I actually got to talk to astronauts aboard Space Shuttle Columbia using ham radio when I was in seventh grade. And that was also a life-changing experience. It got me really passionate about space. And then the last great mentor comes into the story kind of when I was 20, three or so when I was at Caltech and I met this woman named Regina Dugan at a random Caltech event. She had done her PhD there. And then at, at the time she was the director of DARPA, the research arm of the DOD. And Regina just kind of, to be candid, she instantly saw my talent more than I think anyone else. And she took a huge risk on me. And um, she recruited me to go work for her at DARPA as a you know young person. I I think I was, if I do the math, I think I was 24 when I met her and she recruited me on the spot to go to Afghanistan. It was pretty crazy, pretty crazy bet to place on someone. Um, and so I said yes to that. And I dropped my PhD. I moved to the backpack to Washington, DC. Um, and I kind of worked on this program for two years. The idea was basically to bring ideas from big data and machine learning to the war efforts, you know, this is 2010 and there we just weren't not like that. It was the very early days of big data, you know, cloud computing was still very nascent and not many people had brought these ideas to the DOD. And so we had a very broad mandate to just go try to solve problems using these ideas. Um, and it was a truly life-changing experience to go deploy with the military. I gained an unbelievable respect for that community. Um, and we did some pretty incredible work and it gave me a reputation in the DOD to be candid. Like I was part of a team that received a medal from the Secretary of Defense and kind of, we did a bunch of things that are not public that um, just kind of gave us reputation and gave us a lot of credibility. And so from there, having this credibility and having this understanding of how the government works and how technology in the government works. I came up with an idea with two friends, basically for a cybersecurity company and DARPA basically was starting a program that we had helped come up with the idea of. And so we left, started a company, applied to win a contract. You know, at that point, when you leave, you're applying just via all the normal kind of channels, but we were domain experts and we had helped come up with the kind of problem statements. We were actually able to win a $10.5 million contract. There's just three, I think I was 26 at the time. So it's three 26 year olds, uh, which is pretty, which is pretty unusual. 
especially back then, government contracting has actually gotten a lot easier uh, in the last eight, nine years. And so we won this contract. We got a very hard lesson in government contracting pretty quickly where um, this $10.5 million contract ended up getting cut to a $5.5 million contract be before we got a dollar wired in because Congress couldn't approve the defense budget for that year. This was like sequestration, if you go back to 2012 is, is what it was called. Um, but we did get the $5.5 million. And so we used that to hire just a lot of our smartest friends, started building a technology. We It took a couple of years to get the technology to the point where we could sell it. Myself and my two co founders as you can tell, I'm, you know, I have pretty nerdy technical background. Um, but of myself and my three co-founders, we were all PhDs and I was the most extroverted, you know, the least nerdy of the three of us maybe, which doesn't say that much, but it means that I got stuck with all the sales. And that was another just absolutely life-changing kind of experience for me being forced to go to Goldman Sachs and meet with people for two years, trying to convince them to buy our technology that didn't quite exist yet and just get doors slammed in my face and, you know, following leads with a 1% chance that they would lead anywhere. I mean, it was, it was truly one of the most humbling experiences I've been through. And I, I came away with incredible respect for sales leaders and, you know, people that, especially people that do zero to one sales, like the first sales of a new product. I, I wanted to quickly ask uh, and definitely yeah. want to hear more, but we have a lot of students here that, uh, are MBAs, but they're working with PhD students and other, you know, engineering students at MIT. Uh, so just wanted to quickly ask, um, you know, how do you go about trying to explain a technical product to folks in the outside world at Goldman Sachs and others that maybe don't have that understanding um, and straddle those two universes of your team, which is much more technically literate versus the outside world? So just Something that I actually think is even more important than that question, to be candid, is getting people to be willing to listen to you. You know, like it's it's one thing to be able to explain something really well or have great analogies, but a prerequisite to that is for people to even be willing to listen to you and listen seriously and listen with an open mind. And the thing that I had going for me was because we had done this defense work and we had kind of done high profile work and we were getting very warm introductions. Like I found that people were willing to listen to what we had built just with Dumbo ears. Like they'd listen very seriously and in intently and kind of believe we had enough credibility that we were entering the room where people would want to believe what we were telling them rather than wanting to disbelieve. And so I just, I do want to acknowledge that like that is actually probably the most important thing is showing up to the room in the first place where someone is inclined to really believe you and, and already be very excited. And then I just, I think a lot of people miss doing that pre-work um, to kind of, and, and not everyone can, like different people have different backgrounds and different access and all that. And so I'll just acknowledge that that was actually the most important thing for us was the story of what we had done the few years before and how seriously that led people to take us. Um, and I think for people to try to replicate in their own ways, like to, just to have that insight that, you know, it's, there's a lot of pre-work that goes into how seriously someone takes you. And so as an example, in my job as a VC, um, we get sent thousands of decks per year per investor, like literally thousands. And you can only meet with about one in every 10 companies for the decks you get sent. Like I get sent about 5,000 decks. I meet with about 500 companies, you know, invest in four or five. It's a pretty crazy filter. Um, and when you have that volume of inbound, like it kind of forces you to rely on crutches or like, you know, proxy decision-making. And so whether it's, right or not like if you get an intro from a sequoia founder to me you know and that sequoia founder meaning that they're already someone we think very highly of and highly enough to invest in them like if they think very highly of you that's the type of thing that would make us you know come in really wanting to believe the story and give you the benefit of the doubt and i acknowledge i absolutely acknowledge all the problems with that like 
I, I totally get it, but it's also just the reality of the math of like having five, getting 5,000 or so companies sent to each person a year. Like you kind of need to rely on some of these things. And so I'm just sharing whether or not the sausage should be made that way. I'm just sharing that's how it's made. And so then in terms of the specific question of, of like how to sell, I think, you know, so we invented a new category. That category now has a name. It's called attack surface management. And there's probably 10 companies doing this. Um, but when you're creating a new category, it's much harder than when you're entering an existing category that is already names associated to everything. And I think for us, like we just came up with some really good analogies. And we also came up with some really scary stories and anecdotes. And it took a year or two to build those really scary anecdotes. But so just to tell you, give you guys some examples. So what our product did is like, if you were a big company, Goldman Sachs or the Navy or whatever, in, in 2012, these entities didn't know what their own networks are. So like, if you asked Goldman, give me a list of all of the IP addresses that correspond to the 200,000 devices you own, they did not have a tool that could do that. They had an Excel spreadsheet that humans would input of what they thought their network was, but it was not accurate. It was wildly wrong, actually. People didn't realize how wrong their master lists were. And so we were the first people to come up with a tool that could algorithmically or you know, programmatically figure out what companies' networks are. Um, and what ended up happening is we, we started to accumulate just some insane story. So one story, there was a Fortune 100 tech company. So meaning that they should have good cybersecurity. And they had, when we looked at their network, they gave us their list of what they thought their network was. And when we looked at it, we realized that they had, their list had 60,000 IPs owned by the Chinese government on their master list. And so what this means is that they had, like the Chinese government could basically just send whatever data they wanted in or out of that Fortune 100 tech company's network. And it wouldn't set off any alerts because they thought the traffic was just moving inside their own network. And these you know, IPs were whitelisted. So just absolutely catastrophic, like literally catastrophic failure. Someone can just move as much data as they want you know, into China and this company didn't even realize. And so we started to accumulate examples like that. And the examples and anecdotes were way more powerful than any of the storytelling we could do around like we're doing network mapping, you know, you need a map to defend your network and all that is really the stories that were scary. Awesome. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, let's just jump right into, I guess, the, uh, well, from there you finished your PhD or had you already had it completed by then? No. So basically to, to finish up, started the company, um, it took a year from the time that we were selected for award before the money actually hit the bank. As I said, like Congress was struggling with their budget. And so in that period, we all tried to finish our PhDs. Uh, one of the three successfully did that. Myself and the other like did not finish our PhDs in that time. Uh, and then things really started to get real with the company. So we all had to take leaves of absence again and go full-time into the company. I was there full-time for about four or five years. And then um, we ended up promoting our COO to CEO. And I left and went back to Caltech as to finish my PhD. And I moved into, I stayed on as chairman of the board, but not in a day-to-day -day operation. And, um, you know, did that. And quickly, I actually didn't finish my PhD again. Like I got recruited to Google Ventures. And so I went to GV after maybe four months back at Caltech. Uh, but I basically finished all the research and just had to write my thesis. And so I went to GV. I was there for almost three years, um, finished my thesis while I was there. And then I got recruited to join Sequoia about two years ago and moved over to Sequoia. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for walking through your background, um, especially the academic and the operating aspects. Would love to dive a little bit deeper into uh, what you look for as far as investments uh, obviously, you know, having you mentioned crutches of, um, you know, if there's some background of the team, maybe they worked at DARPA or Google or a company that you, you really respect. Maybe they went to MIT, which is great for us. 
Um, but beyond that, what really gets you excited as far as new deals, or maybe you talk about one of the deals that you've done either at GV or at Sequoia over the last few years? Um, it's a great question. I think I, everyone has a different answer to this. Like everyone's looking for different things. I am, I am kind of, I'm a weird investor. I think I view things differently than most. I'm really a swing for the fences type of person. And pretty much everything I've invested in is what I'd call a market creation opportunity. Like I very rarely go after some existing industry. I'm really looking for opportunities where it's like you could legitimately create a $100 billion company if it works. Whether or not it will work, it's, you know, it's, it's hard, but I'm truly looking for things that are massive, massive markets where it's completely white space and the team is exceptional and has some unique insights around like either why the timing is finally right now or about how they'll enter the market that no one has ever come up with before. Um, and so I, I can walk you through a bunch of fast examples. So one of my more recent investments called Gather Town, there's two of the founders, four founders, two of them are MIT undergrad alums. The other two are Carnegie Mellon alums. Gather Town is like Minecraft meets Zoom. It's basically 2D world. Like some people at MIT use it. You guys, some of you may have used it. It's basically Minecraft meets Zoom. And I mean, these guys are incredibly ambitious and they're trying to build the metaverse. Like, most of you probably know what the metaverse is, but the metaverse would be a 2D virtual world that you know has a parallel to the physical world, and some people actually live in it. And it's a it's a crazy, ambitious idea, and there's a decent chance we'll never get there. But this team really does want to build that. And COVID is just an incredibly powerful why now, where you know it forced people to live online for the last year, and this team got unbelievable traction. Like it's, it's literally unbelievable how fast they've grown in the last year. And so incredibly talented technical team, big market creation opportunity and really powerful why now in coronavirus. You know, another example is called Node, K-N-O-W-D. This is a chemicals marketplace. I don't know if any of you have any experience with the chemicals industry, but the chemicals industry is, utterly massive. It's about five to six trillion a year in sales. So it's about five times bigger than the pharma industry. Uh, it's about 60% bigger than oil and gas. Oil and gas is like three trillion a year in sales, three to 3.5. Uh, so this utterly massive industry, incredibly fragmented, which is important if you're going to try to create a marketplace, like it needs to be very, very fragmented. You know, the biggest company in chemicals is BSF. They only do about 1.5% of the total sales in the industry every year. They do about 60 to 80 billion a year in sales. And so it's an incredibly fragmented long tail industry. Each of the big companies has thousands of products that they make. And no, like product discovery in this industry has been impossible. And this has been one of the slowest industries to digitize. And the node is this unique team where Ali, the CEO, he had spent the last 20 years in the chemicals industry. His dad was a chemist for, for DuPont. And then he went to University of Washington, studied CS, and joined a dot-com era chemicals, like chemtech company. It's called ChemPoint. It's basically Salesforce for chemicals. It was a CRM started in 1999, I believe, if not 2000, um, to just basically be Salesforce for chemicals. He stayed there for 17 years. They got to 400 million a year in revenue. So, you know, he just, he really is a deep domain expert. And then his co-founder, Wojo, is Polish. He was a staff engineer at LinkedIn. Um, being a staff engineer is a big deal. There's like 50 of them. He was one of the only ones that didn't have a PhD in that role. And Wojo ran all the web scraping programs for, for LinkedIn. And so, meaning like when you go, when you go to, Sequoia's webpage and it estimates the number of employees and estimates like where the ad, you know, HQ is and all of that. Like he built that product. And so the insight for Node was that over the last six or seven years, the, chem the big chemical incumbents started to finally put PDFs on their web pages with their product description. And so this company was the first to go scrape. They downloaded over a million PDFs from the web and then they put all that data in one place and made it searchable. And so 
you know, massive market. People have tried to create a marketplace in the past. It didn't work. You know, domain expert team are one that's really good at technology, one that knows the chemicals industry really well. And they had the insight that there's now all these PDFs online for the first time. Let's be the first to scrape them, structure them, make it searchable, and then get a flywheel going from that. So these are just two examples of kind of team of domain experts or just incredibly talented, like a clear why now and all that. All right, I'm done. No, awesome. I, I appreciate it. Uh, Gather Town's a good example that we should be spending more time as MBAs with the undergrads because I know a couple of them, as you mentioned, graduated 2019 and 2020. Um, and we definitely have customers uh, in this room now. I know several people I've talked to that use it in their internships. So uh, definitely getting traction that people really love. I wanna open it up to questions. So people can raise their hands in the, in the participant list and we'll just go through as people raise their hands. All right, Jay, you're first. Hi, thanks for coming in to talk to us. Uh, I am a second year MBA and I'm interviewing at a couple of different startups that are Sequoia based and are Sequoia funded. And I've noticed that there's cultural similarities in the teams and the way that they are helpful and also just in a lot of ways that they interact with me. I'm curious if you think at all about culture of the team or the founders values and culture when you're making investments. It's probably, I mean, it's after all the market questions, it's one of the top things I think about. And maybe not as much in the investment decision, but once you're on the board of the company, it's probably the number one thing I think about is the culture of the team and co-founder dynamics as well. So, and I think a lot of the culture comes from the co-founder dynamics. Like if, if the co-founders are patient with each other and have a great relationship, like it, will oftentimes lead to a healthy culture. Whereas if the co-founders secretly hate each other, it'll lead to like, you know, in-groups, out-groups, silos, very political cultures. And um, I just, I we, like I personally, but also we as Sequoia think an incredible amount of about culture at Sequoia as a firm, you know, with our companies, with, you know, employees, with founders, all of it. And so it's a, at the top of the list. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, okay, again, anyone who wants to ask a question, make sure to do so in Zoom. Uh, as we wait for more, I'll ask a bit more about how you go about diligence uh, on the, the team, technical aspects, uh, the TAM, like what's your general framework for looking at investments? So, for me, you know, it's, it's market is probably the first thing I think about. And then, and like, not just it, there's a market is not enough. Like there's a lot to market. You got to think about the size of it. You got to think about how, like the why now you've got to think about just like the dynamics of the market. Are there, are the incumbents really sophisticated and like real competition or not? But anyways, I think a lot about the dynamics of the market. Um, in terms of the team, like candidly, one of the things I'm looking for is for founders that know more about their industry than I do. And I, I, I do not mean that in a condescending or in an arrogant way, but, you know, as a VC, you see so many companies and so many patterns that you just start to learn a lot about a lot of different industries. And it, it's really there's a lot of times like, you know, I got pitched recently by a founder who had a fatal misunderstanding of their industry. And, you know, when that happens, like you're just, you're not going to invest. And, you know, it's, I'm lucky to meet with so many different companies in different industries. And you just start to see the pattern, start to understand these industries. And that's something I'm, I really look for is founders that know more about their industries than, than I do. Um, and in terms of diligencing this, like, you know, we always do a lot of diligence. I think we do a lot more diligence than most firms. We don't always get it right, but like we, we do a lot more diligence than other firms. 
and where you, but there's kind of like a finite, I'd say you can do like 10 to 15 diligence calls per company for like a series A maximum. And where you allocate those calls depends on the company. Like for Node, I didn't have to do many founder references for two reasons. One, Wojo had worked at LinkedIn, which is a Sequoia company. And so we were able to get like the detailed analysis of him, like from the LinkedIn team. And we just trust that really, we weight that very heavily because it's a Sequoia company. And then with Ali, I had personally spent a lot of time with him. As long as my wife is Persian, he's Persian. We had a lot of good Persian food in the, you know, three months leading up to investment. So I didn't have to do as much diligence on them. Whereas for like young founders, I would do a lot of diligence on the founders, but there, I didn't know anything about the chemicals market. And so I did an incredible, I talked to like at least 15 companies in the chemicals industry, some of whom are current customers, some of whom are not. And you want both of those views, you know, you kind of, you always want to hear the skeptics view as well. And for example, like some of the non-customers were very skeptical about it and it was valuable to hear how they think about it. So we talk about, we do both on-sheet references and off-sheet and that's for markets, that's for people, et cetera. And it's oftentimes the off-sheet references that are the most important. Awesome. That's great. Uh, and uh, it's it's good for us to know, you know, some of our pre-MBA experiences can go a long way, especially if they're at, you know, the type of firms that you've worked with before. Um, oh, we have a bunch more questions. Okay, great. So let's jump to the next one. Uh, Kishan, our, uh, our incoming member of our community coming, I guess, next fall, but getting a head start. Hi, hi Sean and, uh, and Justin. Thanks again for, for the call. Um, so, uh, before I pitch uh, Kenya to you, Sean, um, I think uh, here's my question. You know, you mentioned at the start of the call, you meet with about one in 100 companies a year and you see about 500 companies a year in total and you invest in four to five a year. And the question is, uh, two questions around this. Uh, the first is, how do you, between all of these companies that you meet with, how do you filter out and how do you kind of readjust your investment thesis, right? Because it, even if you're looking at two companies a day, it probably gets you confused, right? So personally, how do you approach that problem? Uh, and then in terms of the uh, investment process, uh, perhaps this is a bit of a naive question, but I'd be very grateful if you could just talk through very at a high level, what would be your investment process about any of, any of your one successful company, for example. Thank you. So this is not what you all want to hear, but the way this works is not as formulaic as you may think. Like every company is a little, not even a little, every company is different. Every investment is different. The way you met the company, the way you did diligence, like it is all different. And you know, you kind of need to have good intuition. That's like one of the things that separates good investors from not as good is just having, and I'm not saying I'm a good investor yet. It's too early in my career to know one way or the other. But when you, I'm lucky to work with some great investors like Mike Moritz and Ruloff and, and Doug Leone and Alfred and some of the greatest in the business. And if you look even between those four, the, their processes are all incredibly different and the types of questions they ask are incredibly different. And so the first thing I would say is, is I just wouldn't rely too much on, on formula or process. Um, and I mean, sometimes it's just instincts. And so like to give you an example, um, I, I met John and Patrick call, you know, with my company founders fund led our seed round, our seed round was a $6 million seed round because we had the government revenue. And I met John and Patrick at a, at a Founders Fund event. Founders Fund had invested in both of our companies. So I met them in call it 2014, something like that. And Stripe was starting to work, but it was much, much earlier than it is now. Like they weren't famous founders at the time. You know, uh, Patrick is a MIT dropout. So, he, you know, again, a lesson to stay close to MIT undergrads. But I met them and it was just unbelievably obvious to me that Patrick is just truly brilliant and special. The way I met him was actually pretty funny. He was in a conversation with a very high profile founder, someone who was much higher profile than him at the time. And that person was 
totally condescending to Patrick. They were actually talking about quantum computing. And this guy was talking to Patrick like he's a total idiot and doesn't know anything about quantum computing. And I could tell that this more famous founder was totally wrong because I, I have a PhD in that field. So I kind of jumped in the conversation just to defend this guy that like I felt like was being talked down to. And Patrick and I ended up just like continuing the, that guy kind of stormed off and Patrick and I just kept talking. And that conversation is just unbelievably obvious that this is one of the most special people on the planet, like one of the most curious, broad interests, good heart, just total incredible person. And so I didn't have any money at the time and I was a founder, but I registered in my brain, like this is one of the most impressive people I've ever met. I would, I would back this person in any way, period. And so when I got to Google Ventures, literally my first week we invested into Stripe and it was, they had a round that was in flight and we had zero time to do diligence. Like we literally could not do diligence. We had to make a decision in one meeting, like at the meeting. And it was just, sometimes you find people like Patrick and it's, and like, it's moving fast and you just, the diligence is just, this person is unbelievable. But then you have Situations like Node, where I did an incredible amount of diligence, you know, like, or, I mean, you know, I invested in a space launch company. You can guess which one. Like, I spent months doing diligence and kind of becoming an expert and talking to, I went and talked to like 10 of their engineers, you know, without permission and kind of the lead engineers for a bunch of different of the core systems and heard it from them. Like, where are you going to be in two years? Where are you going to be in five years? And not talking to the CFO but hearing it from the engineers. And so anyways, it's just, there are these two vastly different extremes and it's really hard to paint with broad strokes. Thank you, Sean. Uh, awesome. Okay, Yvette. Hi, Sean. Thanks for spending with us. Um, my question is kind of goes back to your thesis on investing in new categories and kind of category creation. So given, you know, the, I guess, year plus that we've just had with COVID, uh, I think we've seen a lot of startups, right, and, and business segments take off. But interesting hearing, you know, from your perspective, how has the behavioral changes and I think speeds on digitization changed your view on new category creation maybe coming in, in the near term? Um, these have all been great questions. So, you know, one of the things that I love about, I mean, I love, I'm so lucky to be at Sequoia and I work with just truly incredible people and my partners really shape my thinking a lot. And one of my partners um, at the beginning of coronavirus, call it in like April, so, you know, it's like very, April a year ago. So it's very early in the coronavirus. He made a comment that coronavirus because we started to see like the instacart metrics and the doordash metrics and you know they were just years ahead of plan already in two months because of changing people's behavior and my partner made a comment that coronavirus has accelerated the future like that we've been building towards by 10 years and you know we've at sequoia we've been investing in this digital future and delivery and, you know, remote work and all these things, but something like coronavirus is a catalyst that can accelerate the future in certain like dimensions by a decade. And so then Ruloff made a comment that like, he thinks video is the new platform. And he ended up tweeting that comment around then. And, you know, it's a, it may seem like a very simple comment, but, and again, this is over a year ago, and it's just the insight that everyone's going to be on video for the next year. And that's going to truly change people's behavior. And we're lucky that because we were investors in Zoom, we were seeing just the shocking metrics of how much time people were spending on Zoom. And so like, that is what led me to invest in GatherTown was these insights that like, you know, where COVID is pulling the digital future forward by 10 years and video is a new platform. Well, if video is a new platform, then, you know, maybe there's opportunities for things that, that are not Zoom and are maybe better for specific video applications like remote office and gather falls into that domain. And so I just, 
I'm very lucky to work with such smart people. And we really try to give each other prepared mind. When someone has a, an insight about what the future might look like, we share those with each other. And you never, like Rulof had the insight that video is the next platform. And I'm the one that made the investment in Gather. And it's just kind of because I met the Gather team and I connect with them very deeply. It's funny, but one of the founders took a class with one of my friends, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon. And it's like a, probably the most famous class at CMU these days. And like this kid ace Keenan Crane's class and Keenan Ho, like all the Putnam fellows at CMU all work for Keenan. And so I just had this touch point and I bonded with him over that. And it's just, there's a difference between sharing the insights and then like, it's not necessarily the right investor to work with any one company. And so I hope I answered your question with a lot of stories. You did, thank you. Great, we have a couple of questions that I see are typed into the chat. So maybe we'll go through through both of them. Uh, the first one from, from Rue, uh, do you wanna read it yourself or? or uh, yeah, 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 sure. Um, hi, Sean. Thanks so much for sharing your stories. It's really interesting. So I have two questions. The first one is that, could you please share a little bit on how you reflect your investing approaches? Like what are the, for example, what are the main adjustments that you have made um, to your thinking framework since you started, you know, investing? The second question is, what is your thought on, you know, leveraging data science and venture capital? Yeah. Thank you. I like both these questions. On the first one, um, I I don't want to out this person, but I had a partner like somewhere at one of the firms I worked that was just an absolutely wonderful human who I really deeply love and admire and think is one of the smartest people I've ever met. But I don't think they've been a very successful investor. I think they're an incredible operator, an incredible leader but have not been a very successful operator. And when I reflect on what I think went wrong, you know, candidly, it's that this person is such a good operator that they would go find companies where, and think if I was the CEO of this company, like I could go, this is what I would do with it. And if I did these things, then it would be wildly successful. And one of the big lessons as a VC is like, you are not sitting in the driver's seat. You are investing in a team and people, and hopefully they'll listen to a little bit of your advice, maybe 2% of it, but you're really investing in something that's going to kind of go and kind of go off and, and has to execute and operate on its own. And so one big mistake I've actually seen a lot of people make, but this one former partner of mine, probably the most acutely, is investing in companies where you see the path to like making it great. It's different than if that team will go actually make it great. And I've seen, it's a very dangerous trap. And I've seen people really make poor investments by that, um, just by that like logic. So I, I think that's, that's one of the biggest insights that I've had. Um, I think the other one, this is so obvious, but just be patient, you know, like it's, it's crazy. This is a very humbling industry and business. And I have seen, I have personally had companies that were doing incredibly well in the short run, like for the first year you invest or whatever. And then they just make some huge mistake or they get unlucky or whatever. And like that initial, they, everyone in the Valley is talking about how great the company is. And then it like fizzles out and, and like, isn't, it doesn't amount to much. And I've seen the opposite happen where companies are so slow in the beginning and like not exciting and no one pays attention. And then they just three years later start to become really exceptional businesses. So something that Doug Leone made a comment once at Sequoia, he said that like in this business, you can look really stupid for passing on a company in the short run and then really smart in the long run or all of the other variants of that, you know, like you can look really smart for investing in a company in the short run, then really stupid in the long run. Or anyways, like it's, it's you really need to be patient and it's like the end results that matter. And it's like, it can be very misleading to get caught up in the hype or in the going really fast in the beginning or whatever. And so those are two insights. On the data science, I, 
you know, I obviously have a very deep data science background. Like I've done a lot of data science in the real world. And so on the one hand, I am a believer in the power. I mean, I firsthand like experienced the power of data science, but I also think that there's just a lot of things in venture capital that it's, that are just not suited to data science at all. And so like data science is good at change detection. Data science is good at telling you one signal is changing. It can say that, okay, the LinkedIn headcount growth has been very slow for this company. And then now the last six months has been explosive. What is happening there? You know, data science is good at that. It can tell you Twitter sentiment, like, wow, the Twitter sentiment about this company is incredible. But to try to aggregate all of these signals into investment decisions, like I don't think data science is anywhere close to, especially for early companies, like for seed A, B, even C, um, where so much then is like evaluating the quality of the founder, you know, data science to have a good data model, you usually need good training data. And something that you guys will understand, but most people don't understand is you usually need the whole problem to be what's called stationary rather than non-stationary, you know, and where like the training data reflects the future. And think about in this industry, like, you know, just because SaaS was a great place to invest the last three years, doesn't mean it's a great place to invest the next three years, you know, just because like, you know, San Francisco was the best place to build a company the last 10 years doesn't mean it's the best place to build a company the next 10 years. And it's just, it's a not like, just because like no chemical marketplace has worked in the past doesn't mean none will work in the future. And it's just the data science has really hard challenges. Like, you know, I've, you know, I've, it doesn't, it can't tell if a CEO is a pathological liar. It can't tell, you know, if like you have IP problems, you know, it, it, there's just, the dimensionality of the problems is too high. So data science is incredibly powerful for change detection, but very hard to roll that into a full prediction. I see. Thank you so much for that answer. I guess that's just in general data science and investment like area, like where, especially for the long-term investing, it's just so much changes that maybe the past data just doesn't reflect the future. And there's no way for you to collect information about your future. It's about judgment calls. And it's too high dimensional of a problem. And so I'm not saying that data science can't be helpful. It's just that it, I don't think it's, I think we're very, very long ways away from it being the only thing. Okay, thank you. It's a good segue into the next question from Jay around signals as far as location. So yeah, thank you. Um, my question is a lot of us are in a point in our life where we can pack up and leave and move somewhere else. and. I coming to school thought I was going to move to San Francisco because I want to work in tech, but following Twitter, it seems like everyone is moving to Austin and Miami. So I'm curious about what your, what's your long-term perspective on San Francisco as a tech hub and an entrepreneurial hub specifically. Um, I mean, this is, I love this question. You know, I, a little secret is I basically lived in LA the last five or six years when I joined Sequoia, I had to move to San Francisco, but during COVID, I've been able to live in LA again. My wife and I are both from here. And I actually personally viewed that as a big advantage for me. Like I just have a different network than most of the people in VC. Like I had a couple of days a week at a slightly slower pace where I could really think deeply about the future. And anyway, so I, I'm biased here. I'm, I'm on the far extreme and I have been for years that like, I don't think San Francisco is the only place to be the way it was 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, the reality of this question is like, it's somewhere in the middle. Like, I'm actually, I, I think you can be, I'm bullish on San Francisco, but I'm also bullish on everywhere else. Like, I think one of the things happening right now is just a market expansion of tech in general. Like, you know, the num the total market cap of technology companies is you know, staggering compared to 10 years ago. The number of unicorns is staggering. The number of cities that have unicorns is staggering. And, you know, when the whole market is expanding by a factor of 10 every five years, like it, that dominates over any one city. And so my advice would probably be go wherever you feel like where you love the most and where your instincts tell you. Um, and if that's San Francisco, I think San Francisco will probably have the most tech opportunity of any one city the next five years, but the relative dominance will be 
just a shadow of what it was 10 years ago. You know, like you look at the number of unicorns globally five years ago, I think San Francisco probably, I mean, had greater than, if you take out China, San Francisco had probably 50% of them or more globally. And now it's much less than that. And five years from now, it's going to be way less than that. And so, um, but San Francisco is still going to have a disproportionate amount and more than probably any other city in the US, except maybe New York, where the numbers from New York are pretty crazy right now. And so I, anyways, that go, go where you love and where your instincts tell you and you'll be fine in any of them. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a little bit more time and I know there's a couple more questions. Well, Pablo, perhaps you wanna ask your question next. Thank you, uh, Justin. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, actually, my question is a follow-up to a prior question, uh, simply a twist of it. Um, analytics applied to how your founders uh, think about their businesses and how their mental frameworks work. How important is that to you? Have you seen it be a marker of good founders or is it coincidental and intuition is equally as valuable? It's, a, it's an important question. Again, though, like, I don't think there's a black and white answer. Um, I think a lot of times the best founders have it all and maybe not for one person, but across the founding team. Like I have one set of founders where it's two people and one of them is just like one of the most analytical, rigorous people I've met. And his co-founder is like not rigorous at all, like not analytical, but he's just an unbelievable storyteller and salesman. And, you know, all of those skills are important, like the analytical rigor, but like the salesmanship and the storytelling and stability and empathy. And it's like, you, you kind of need it all across the founding team. And so uh, you could ask the question, like, what are the most important attributes? And it's really hard because it kind of depends on the type of business. Like, is it a customer facing business or not? You know, is it um, like, if it's a hardware business, it's not that important or like uh, salesmanship and storytelling is not that important. It's going to be all about the quality of the product. And it's just, it's a hard question to answer. It's important, but I want all of it. And the, the people, our most successful founders, I think have just been freaks, freak humans that have an incredible range, like dynamic range is what I look for. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sean.